Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about E. Kosofsky Sedgwick. We read two texts from her today. The first is a book called Between Men, English Literature and Male Homosocial Desire. And the second is a book called The Epistemology of a Closet. The first text was published in 1985, so just five years before Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. And the second text appears in 1990, the same year as, as Judith Butler's text. So we can see, you know, these are important kind of contemporaneous works that are developing theories that are really going to move us beyond some of the concerns of second wave feminism and into a space of um, a kind of a third wave feminism and queer theory or post-feminism, certainly operating in the mode of post-structuralism and deconstruction. So I want to say a few things about each text. The first one between men, um, in some ways, perhaps her investigation of homosocial continuum uh, and its relationship to homosexuality is a little, um, well, in, in some ways her observations are less radical today. And I think that much like Judith Butler, some of these ideas have kind of moved down from high theory um, or they were perhaps already kind of anticipated in some of the things that these thinkers were observing uh, such that they become almost taken for granted, let's say. And so I, what I mean specifically is that when Eve Kosofsky Cedric is writing in 1985, the binary between gay and straight is pretty strict. Um, you know, we have you know, a really powerful gay rights movement that emerges in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, but there really is kind of a strong contrast set up between heterosexual and homosexual. So for her to be exploring the continuum between those two and to trace that in literature is really offering something that was new at the time and will inform theory, subsequent works of theory. Now, in our own time, I think that some of, I think there is more space to think about that continuum. And this, I think, um, is often referred to as, you know, pansexual or, um, you know, any kind of like poly identity or bi identity or even just the identity of queer. The label of queer is something that really emerges, you know, coming out of the work of people like Sedgwick and others, such that we can have a more fluid and a more kind of open idea of sexuality. So if our ideas seem kind of like, well, that's obvious, part of it is because maybe we have moved a little bit more in that direction, but not fully. And I think that for that reason, her ideas really help us not only understand our own moment, but also analyze this dynamic in literature. Now, the text that we get read for today doesn't include any of her literary analysis of the 18th and 19th century English literature. But if you're curious about that, you know, go get the book, order the book, uh, and read the rest of it and see what you think about her analysis. So she begins by asking whether we can recognize the continuum of homosexual and homosocial. And she defines homosocial as, well, <laughs> activities that are often referred to as male bonding, but relationships between people of the same gender, um, deep, intimate relationships that are not necessarily sexual, but then she also later will want to historicize sexual and say, you know, that which we describe as sexual has also shifted and is historically and culturally contingent. Nevertheless, the homosocial relationship is distinct from the homosexual relationship insofar as this question of sexuality seems to be left out of it. Um, one can have a homosocial relationship and still be, quote, straight, right? The bromance, we can think of that, um, <laughs> that kind of genre of literature and film today. But even if there are spaces for homosocial relationships, especially in the context of male relationships, there's always this anxiety around homosexuality. And so the homosocial is often policed by the anxiety of homosexuality, such that you know, one needs to constantly underscore, no, no, we're just, we're just good friends, you know, so that, that relationship between men where you know, the, the, the infamous like pat on the back hug, right, rather than just an intimate hug, or other ways that men like indicate that the homosocial is in opposition to the homosexual. Um, there's also something that she says kind of intrinsic about the way that homosocial relationships are policed that, that sort of suggests that um, 
there's like a kernel of homophobia within the relationship itself. And so she lays this out in the first you know, couple paragraphs of the text. So take a look at that. Um, I, I'm almost though more interested in her theory of desire, a theory that she's drawing from people like Freud, Freud's concept or the psychoanalytic concept of libido, um, where she says that you know, she's interested in desire rather than love because love is just, a, it's a word for, an emotion, but desire, she says, desire is um, a structure, really. And she says this on page 2467, and she says, from the most part, I will be using desire in an analogous way to the psychoanalytic use of libido, not for a particular effective state or emotion, but for the effective or social force, the glue, even when its manifestation is hostility or hatred or something less emotively charged, that shapes an important relationship. How far this force is properly sexual, what historically it means for something to be sexual, will be an active question. So we can think of desire as a structure, a social force, a glue that shapes a relationship, but then we can think of that as somehow well, separate from sexuality, but also part of sexuality. But sexuality is going to be a, a term that's always open for debate and always historically and culturally specific. So she's separating desire from love and from emotions, and she's also separating desire from sexuality as such and trying to understand it in a more complex way. Okay, so here is where she kind of moves into a discussion of the way in which this relationship of desire to the homosocial relationship is one that is much more um, embraced for women. And I think this helps us understand some of what Barbara Smith is doing with Sula, you know, when she's looking at the relationship between Sula and Nell as being lesbian, but she says, oh, it's not necessarily about whether they you know, engage in sex act of any kind, but the text is still lesbian. I think that this resonates very well with what Cedric is looking at here when she says that there seems to be a lot of space for women to have relationships that are complicated, emotionally rich, homosocial in this kind of um, really dynamic way. So there is a homosocial continuum for women, whereas for men, the homosocial continuum is um, is much more repressed and censored. So you are either friends or lovers, right? You are, there's no kind of gradual, you know, um, series of intimate relationships in between. Now, yes, you have your relationship with your brother. Yes, you have your relationship with your father if you're a man, but those are always going to be constrained by patriarchal anxiety around homosexuality. So she really is showing us the way that gender affects the way that um, one can express homosocial desire or um, relationships of any kind. And then she asks an important question. She asks whether all patriarchal societies must be homophobic. And the reason she's bringing this question up is because this is something that feminist theorists like Gail Rubin and others kind of coming writing just before her are thinking about in the 70s. You know, there's an understanding that um, among feminists that the same kind of oppression that women experience in a patriarchal society by and from men is going to also kind of essentially um, or in a kind of as kind of part of the larger picture of patriarchy going to mean uh, homophobia is rampant as well. So women are going to be oppressed by men, by straight men. Gay men are going to be oppressed by straight men because the patriarchal structure of society requires it. Well, specifically because the compulsory heterosexuality or heterosexist society requires it. So she analyzes this on 2468, but then she gives us, um, she kind of shifts gears a little bit. She, she says, actually, Yes, these things are deeply related, homosexuality, or sorry, homophobia and patriarchy, but they are not um, necessarily connected. Before we get that to that point, though, I want us to look at page 2469. She makes a really interesting point here, and I want to ask you about it in your discussion board post. So well, at the bottom of 2468, she says, our own society is brutally homophobic, and the homophobia directed against both males and females is not arbitrary or gratuitous, but tightly knit into the texture of family, gender, age, 
class and race relations. Okay, it's not just some unimportant thing that happens on the side. It's tightly knit into the texture of these things. Our society could not cease being homophobic and have its economic and political structures remain unchanged. Our society could not cease being homophobic and have its economic and political structures remain unchanged. That's a really strong and interesting statement. So I, I really want to hear what you have to say about that. Um, why do you think she says that the structures would would stay the same um, if, or, or could not stay the same rather, if homophobia was done away with? What is it about homophobia that is somehow kind of integral to our economic and political structures? I'll just kind of leave that there. But she does shift from that and says in her analysis of ancient Greek society that here we have an example of homosocial and homosexual relationships that um, don't in any way contradict patriarchy. So you have a deeply patriarchal society, but also one in which there isn't you know, structural homophobia, in which you know, homosexuality is an important part of male relationships. Or, and certainly homosociality as well. So it seems to suggest that patriarchy can be separated from homophobia. Um, at least we have historical examples of that. And in providing those examples, she reminds us that all of this is historically contingent, right? Um, there is no kind of fixed way that we understand what heterosexuality or homosexuality are or what homosociality are, that all of this can change and has changed in different contexts historically and culturally. But even within the context of all that dynamism and change and contingency, she does insist that this kind of, um, that homosociality and homosexuality are connected, deeply connected to the structures of inequality between men and women that govern patriarchal societies. So it, it's not to say that one, that a patriarchal society must be homophobic but there is going to be an integral relationship between the kind of um, the way in which homosexuality is allowed to exist and the oppression of women in terms of, um, in the case of Greek culture anyway, she's looking at the relationship between men and women and slaves. So take a look at that section and make sure you understand you know, what it is that she's saying there because it's much more complicated than it might first appear. 